to the request from our colleague from Arizona simply because I believe it is premature. And for that reason, uh, Mr. President, I object to the request from the senator from Arizona. Objection, objection is heard. Without yep. And without objections, the material will be placed in appropriate in the, place in the records. In the records. Mr. President. Senator from Oklahoma. Mr. President, I think I have time reserved now for uh, up to uh, 30 minutes and uh, would like to first of all say that the subject we've just been listening to is, 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 is life-threatening. It's, it's, um, it's critical. That's not why I'm down here today, because we have something else that's very important. So, Mr. President, I've come to the floor today with some breaking news. The momentum to stop President Obama's war on coal is now so great that some of my colleagues, Senators Alexander and Pryor, are going to introduce a countermeasure to my resolution. My resolution would put a stop to the second most expensive EPA regulation in history, a rule known as Utility Mac which the occupier of the chair is very, very familiar with. The countermeasure is a cover vote, pure and simple. Now, while my resolution requires the EPA to go back to the drawing board to craft a rule in which utilities can actually comply, the measure that Senators Alexander and Pryor are offering would keep Utility Mac in place but delay the rule for six years. Uh, this alternative is a clear admission that the uh, Obama EPA policy is wrong, but it doesn't fix the problem. It simply puts it off, puts off the day of execution, I, I could put it, for a matter of, uh, of six years. Now, what's really going on here? Since my SJR 37 is a privileged motion, it must be voted on by Monday, January 18th, unless we extend it, which I'd be willing to do to after the farm vote takes place. That might be a better idea. It requires 50 votes to pass. The Alexander Pryor cover bill would, uh, will likely be introduced tomorrow. It's a bill that will likely never be voted on and would require 60 votes to pass. Therefore, the senators who want to kill coal by opposing SJR 37 will put their names on the Alexander Pryor bill as co-sponsors to make it look like they're saving coal when in reality that bill, the Alexander Pryor bill, kills coal in six years. Now, we've seen this before. I remember when uh, we considered the Upton Inhofe Energy Tax Prevention Act when it came to the floor last year. It was a measure that would have prevented the EPA from regulating greenhouse gases and under the Clean Air Act. And I, I'd, I'd like to expand on that, but there isn't time to do that. My colleagues offered a number of counter amendments so they could uh, have a cover vote. They wanted to appear like they were reining in the out-of-control EPA, and I think everybody knows what's going on right now with all those regulations, uh, for their constituents back home, all the while letting President Obama go through with his job-killing regulations. Some chose to vote for the only real solution to the problem, the Energy Tax Prevention Act, and some chose to, for the cover vote. But all in all, 64 senators went on record that day as wanting to rein in the EPA but some of them didn't have the courage to stand, uh, to stand by it. Of course, it's highly unlikely that Utility Mac uh, alternative by Senators Alexander and Pryor will ever get a vote, but that's not the point. The point is just to have something out there that senators in tough spot can claim to support. As I've said many times now, the, the uh, vote on uh, uh, SJR 37 will be the one and only opportunity to stop Ob President Obama's war on coal. This is the only vote. There's no other vote out there. If we don't do this, and that rule goes through, utility mag, coal is dead. And this is the only chance we had. Uh, fortunately, we have a thing called the CRA. It's a process uh, whereby a senator can introduce a, a resolution to stop a, a, an unelected bureaucrat from having some kind of an onerous uh, regulation. That's exactly what I've done with this. But this is the only chance for my colleagues to show constituents who they really do stand with. Do they stand uh, which of the colleagues will vote for the only real solution, which is my resolution, and which of the colleagues will vote for a cover vote. So 
So what's changed over the past uh, few weeks to the extent of my colleagues suddenly feeling necessary uh, to pour a cover vote? A lot has changed because the American people are speaking up and they're not happy about the Obama EPA. When I go back to Oklahoma, I mean, that's all I hear from the, it doesn't matter if you're in the ag business, you're in the, in the in military business, if you're in the manufacturing business, they're all talking about the onerous regulations that are taking place in the EPA. I'm pleased to say that we've picked up support of groups representing business and labor. Even more encouraging is a growing number of elected officials are working across the aisle to save coal, and the Senate has taken notice of the first Senate Democrats are beginning to come aboard. I want to commend uh, the Senator Joe Manchin, who happens to be occupying the chair at this time, uh, and S Senator Ben Nelson, they were the first two Senate Democrats to come out publicly in support of our resolution. I must say I'm very glad to see that they have uh, made the right choice to stand with their constituents. Uh, Senator Manchin and his announcement came just after Democrat Governor of West Virginia, Governor Tomlin, uh, sent a letter asking him, as well as Senator Rockefeller, to vote for my resolution because he said EPA's rules have, and I'm quoting now, and the occupier of the chair will know this, the, the, quoting now the, the uh, Democrat governor of West Virginia, he said, the EPA's rules have coalesced to create an unprecedented attack on West Virginia's coal industry. He's still quoting, he said, this attack will have disastrous consequences on West Virginia's economy, our citizens, and our way of life. And that EPA continues on this ill-conceived path to end the development of our nation's most reliable, cost-effective source of energy. You know, I'm very proud of a lot of the officials in West Virginia for what they've come out with. Uh, Governor Tomlin isn't the only Democrat uh, to be concerned. The West Virginia Lieutenant Governor, Jeffrey Kessler, sent a separate letter to the West Virginia Senators and others asking them to pass SJR 37 in order to save what he called West Virginia's, I'm quoting, most valuable state natural resource and industry. He reminds the senators that on May 25th of 2012, the state of West Virginia challenged the MATS rule, that's the Kill Coal rule, and cited four reasons for the, why the defective rule should be rejected. Now that's not all. A group of bipartisan state legislators, for also from West Virginia, wrote senators and others urging the support of SJR 37 out of concern for the devastating impacts on West Virginia. As they wrote, Again, quoting, several West Virginia power plants have announced their closure and the loss of employment that comes with it. Additional, it is pro uh, projected that with the implementation of this rule, consumer electric rates will skyrocket. We all know that's true. Even the president has stated that. I'd like to note that we have support of nearly 80 percent of the private sector uh, those businesses that President Obama claims are doing just fine. Apparently, they don't think they're doing all that fine. American businesses are suffering because of aggressive overregulation by the Obama administration. Let me just take a minute to read the names of just some of the groups who are supporting the, our efforts to pass SJR 37. The National Federation of Independent Business, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, American Farm Bureau, National Association of Manufacturers, Industrial Energy Consumers of America, American Chemistry Council, Association of American Railroads, American Forest and Paper Association, American Iron and Steel Institute, the Fertilizer Institute, Western Business Roundtable, National Rural Electric Co-ops Association. That's just part of them. And then the unions. The unions are coming too. I've talked about the businesses and read all of their groups. Uh, they've come to stop the, 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 the over-regulations that's killing jobs. Cecil Roberts, I had occasion to meet him once. He's the president of the United Mine Workers, one of the largest labor unions in the country. He recently sent a letter to several senators saying that union support for my resolution is, quote, based uh, upon our assessment of the threat that the EPA mass, that's, that's um, the coal killing rule, poses to United Mine Workers Association members, jobs, and the uh, econo economies of coal field communities and future direction of our national energy policy. Remember, Cecil Roberts was the one who traveled across the country in 2008 campaigning for President Obama. 
But after four years of his uh, uh, regulatory barrage designed to kill the mining jobs his union is trying to protect, Mr. Roberts has said this group may choose not to endorse President Obama or just set the election out. As he explained, quote, we've been placed in a horrendous position here. How do you take coal miners' money and say, let's use it politically to support someone whose EPA has pretty much said, you're gone? With even uh, the Democrats and the unions supporting my effort to save millions of jobs that depend on coal, EPA has got to be feeling the pressure. Uh, Gina McCarthy, the assistant administrator of EPA's Office for Air Radiation, came out with a statement last week vehemently denying that Utility Mac and EPA's other rules are in effect an end to coal. She said, quote, this is not a rule that is in any way designed to move coal out of the energy system. Everybody knows better than that. Uh, Administrator uh, Lisa Jackson echoed this sentiment, saying that it is simply uh, coincidental that these rules are coming out at the same time that natural gas prices are low, so utilities are naturally moving toward the natural gas. Her message was, don't blame the EPA. Last week on the Senate floor, I described why their public health and natural gas arguments don't hold up, so I won't go into that today. But what I would like to focus on today is that these claims backing up their efforts to kill coal are just a part of the far left environmental playbook. Now, there's a pretty big difference between what EPA is saying publicly and what they are saying when they talk with their friends, when they feel like they can let their guard down and admit what's really going on down at the EPA. That's exactly what happened in a video recently uncovered the uh, Region 6 uh, Administrator Al Armanderas while President Obama was posing in front of an oil pipeline in my state of Oklahoma, pretending to support oil and gas, Administrator Armanderas told us the truth. The EPA, quote, general philosophy is to crucify and make examples of oil and gas companies. You may remember last week when I spoke on the Senate floor, I talked about a newly discovered video of EPA Regional 1 Administrator Kurt Spaulding, who is caught on tape telling the truth to a group of his environmental friends at Yale University at a gathering there. He said that EPA's rules are specifically designed to kill coal and that the process isn't going to be pretty. He openly admitted, quote, if you want to build a coal plant, you got a big problem. He goes on to say that the decision to kill coal was, and I'm quoting now, painful every step of the way because it would devastate communities in Virginia and Pennsylvania and any area that depends on coal for jobs and livelihood. That's, that's kind of worth repeating. He said it's going to be painful. You know, at least he recognized that. And, he, he, and, and, and we all know exactly what he was, is talking about. I read his whole quotes on the floor of the Senate. They're a little too long to read now, but he talks about how painful it's going to be for all these families who are losing their jobs because we're killing coal. I talked a lot about President Obama's war on coal last week, but what I didn't have time to address was the Obama administration's allies in this war. It would come as no surprise that Administrator Spalding and indeed many of the EPA are working hand in hand with the far left environmental groups to move these regulations to kill coal. Last uh, July, Administrator Spalding spoke at a Boston rally for big green groups, that's capitalized, big green, supporting EPA's utility MAC rule. That's the, that's the rule that would kill coal. In a YouTube video of this rally, Administrator Spalding gushes over the environmental community, thanking them profusely for, quote, weighing in on our behalf. So here we have EPA admitting that Big Green is working for them. His whole speech was directly out of the environmental playbook. This is something that really exists, the environmental playbook. It was all about the so-called health benefits of killing coal. And he said, quote, don't let anybody tell you these rules cost, uh, cost our economy. This is out of their playbook. Administrator uh, Spalding isn't alone in his alliance with Big Green. Also appearing with these far left environmental groups have, was Region 5 Administrator Susan Hedman. According to Paul Chesser, an associate fellow for the National League and Policy Center, Hedman told supporters at the rally, and I'm quoting now, 
We really appreciate your enthusiastic support for this rule. It's quite literally a breath of fresh air compared to what's going on in the nation's capital these days. Of course, the former EPA Region 6 Administrator uh, Armendariz showed us again last week just how close EPA's relationship is with the far less left groups. Armendariz had agreed to testify before Congress. It was actually over in the House, but at the last minute he canceled. As it turns out, Armendariz was in Washington that day, but while he apparently couldn't find time to testify before Congress, he did have time to stop by the Sierra Club for what has been described by the group as a private meeting. I suspect that Armendariz was there for a job interview. His crucify them resume makes him a, the perfect candidate. Of course, EPA and their big green allies can't tell the public the truth that they are crucifying oil and gas companies or that their efforts to kill coal will be painful every step of the way, so they've been deceiving the public with talking points from their playbook. And when I say playbook, I mean a literal document telling activists exactly how to get the emotional effects that they want. We recently got a copy of this, and I've got to say its contents are quite revealing. It comes for uh, usclimatenetwork.com, a coalition of several major environmental groups, and it's a guideline for environmental activists when they attend hearings with the EPA to support the agent's greenhouse, agency's greenhouse gas regulations. A quick search revealed that it was apparently written by a key player in the Sierra Club's uh, Beyond Coal campaign, which is an aggressive effort to shut down all coal plants across America. After offering some tips on the word limit and how to deliver the message, the document urges activists to make it personal. It asks, are you an expected new mother, a grandparent, uh, and if so, it suggests you bring your baby to the hearing. As it states, some examples of great visuals are, quote, holding your baby with you at, at the podium or pushing them in strollers, baby seats, and so forth. Older children are also welcome. It encourages the visual aids of, quote, asthma inhalers, medicine, medicine bottles, health care bills, and, and all these other things that they that are good visuals. The American Lung Association certainly took a page out of this playbook. We've all seen the commercials of the red buggy in front of the Capitol. And, of course, the Sierra Club put their principles to practice by inundating the American people with images of small children with inhalers. Those, the posters for the Beyond Coal campaign also featured abdomens uh, of pregnant women with an arrow pointing to the unborn baby. The words on the arrow are, quote, this little bundle of joy is now a reservoir for mercury. Another one says she's going to be so full of joy, love, smiles, and mercury. Of course, the supreme Irony is that the campaign that claims to be protecting this unborn child is the same one that is aggressively pro-choice. It's coming from a movement that believes there are too many people in the world and actively uh, uh, advocates for population control and abortion. Uh, just after, my, after a hearing in May of this year, the Sierra Club posted pictures of their efforts, and sure enough, there's one of Mary Ann Height, Hitt, I guess it is, director of the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign, holding her two-year daughter, Hazel. But for all their efforts, it's clear that the campaign is about one thing only, and that's killing coal. At a hearing, Mary Ann Hitt with the Sierra Club said, quote, we are here today to thank the Obama administration and to show our ironclad support for limiting dangerous carbon pollution being dumped into the air, unquote. She apparently sees the Obama administration as the closest ally in the Sierra Club's effort. As she uh, has said about the Beyond Coal campaign, quote, coal is a fuel of the past. What we're seeing now is the beginning of a growing trend to leave it there. Of course, it's not just coal that they want to kill. They want to kill coal, oil, and gas. A lot of people don't realize that, but it wasn't long ago that Michael Bruin, the executive director of the Sierra Club, uh, he said, and I quote, as we push the entire coal, uh, to retire coal plants, we're going to work to make sure we're not simultaneously switching to natural gas infrastructure. And we're going to be preventing new gas plants from being built wherever we can. So it's not just coal, it's oil. It's gas, and uh, you have to ask the question, 
At least I get the question to ask when I go back to my state of Oklahoma because there are normal people there and they say, you know, if we don't have coal, oil, and gas, how do you run this machine called America? The answer is you can't. So as this vote on my utility MAC resolution approaches, look for many of my liberal friends to take their arguments directly out of the far left environmental playbook, get ready to see lots of pictures of babies and children wearing inhalers, but these are the same members who voted against my Clear Skies bill that would have given us a 70% reduction in real pollutants. I'm talking about socks, NOx, and mercury. We had that bill up, and, and, and uh, that was one that would have actually had that reduction, a greater reduction than any president has, has advocated. And when President Obama spoke at that time he was in the Senate, he said, I voted against the Clear Skies bill. In fact, I was the deciding vote despite the fact that I'm in a cold state and half of my state thought I'd thoroughly betrayed them because I thought clean air was critical and global warming was, was uh, critical. At, at an April 17th hearing this year, Senator Barrasso and Brenda Archibald of the uh, Sturgeon for Tomorrow, uh, who testified before the EPAW committee, quote, would Michigan Lakes Sturgeon sportsman families have been better off had those uh, reductions already gone into effect when they had the opportunity to pass the Clear Skies answer. Her answer was yes. We're talking about by this time, six years from now, we would, have, would be enjoying those reductions. Now there is a, a crucial, crucial differences between Clear Skies and Utility Mac. Clear Skies would have reduced emissions without harming jobs in our economy because it was based on a common sense market-based approach. It was designed to retain coal in America American electricity generation while reducing emissions each year. On the other hand, utility mech is specifically designed to kill coal as well as all the good paying jobs that come with it. EPA itself admits that the rule will cost, cost $10 billion to implement, but $10 billion will yield $6 billion in benefits. Well, wait a minute, that, that doesn't make sense. That's a cost benefit ratio between 10 billion and 6 million of 1,600 to one. If their campaign so focused on public health, why did Democrats oppose our, our common sense clean air regulations? Simply, uh, very simple, because we didn't include CO2 regulation in the Clear Skies legislation. President Obama's quote only verifies that. He's on record admitting that he voted against these health benefits because regulating greenhouse gases, which have no effect whatsoever on public health, was more important. In other words, the real agenda is to kill coal. Just before uh, the President Obama made the decision to halt the EPA's plant to tighten ozone regulations, then the White House uh, Chief of Staff, Bill Daley, asked, what are the health impacts of unemployment? That is one of the most important questions before this United States Senate in preparation for the vote on my resolution to stop utility mag. What are the health impacts of the, on the children whose parents will lose their jobs due to President Obama's war on coal? What are the health impacts on children in low-income families whose parents will have less money to spend on their well-being when they have to put more and more of their paychecks into the skyrocketing electricity costs? Well, EPA Administrator Spalding gave us a clue about the impacts of unemployment. It would be, as he said, painful, painful every step of the way. Do my colleagues in the United States Senate really want that? So, Mr. President, I deeply regret that I have to be critical of two of my best friends in the United States Senate, Senators Alexander and Pryor, and I say particularly Senator Pryor. Uh, three of my kids went to school with him at the University of Arkansas. He's considered part of our family. He is really my brother. But if you have been to West Virginia and to Ohio and to Illinois, to Michigan, to Missouri, and the rest of the coal states, as I have, and personally visited with the proud fourth and fifth generation uh, coal families, as I have, and certainly the occupier of the chair has. Uh, and, and, and you know that they will lose their livelihood if Alexander Pryor saves the EPA's effort to kill coal. I just can't stand by and idly allow that to happen. Let me conclude by speaking to my friends in this body who have yet to make up their minds as to whether they will support my resolution. I know that everyone here in the United States Senate wants to ensure we continue to make the tremendous environmental progress that we've made over the, over the past few years. And we really have. The Clean Air Act many years ago has cleaned up the air. We've had successes. 
Unfortunately, this administration's regulations are failing to strike that balance between growing our economy and improving our environment. Rather, this agenda is about killing our ability to run this machine called America. Again, I want to welcome the support of Senators Manchin and Ben Nelson, who listen to their constituents. It's the rest of the senators from the coal states that I'm concerned about. What about Senators Levin and Sabinow, who come from a state that uses coal 60 percent of its electricity? What about Senator Conrad from the state, uh, uh, a state with 85 percent of the electricity coming from coal? Ohio, where Senator Brown is from, 19,000 jobs depend on coal. Then there's Virginia, home of the uh, Senators uh, Warner and Webb, which has 30. Let's put that up, would you? Yeah, Virginia, it's uh, 31,600 jobs, 16 to 19 percent increase in the utility rates. Let me see the next one. The uh, Arkansas, the war on coal there, uh, that's 44.9 percent of electricity generation in the state of Arkansas. Next one. The uh, Tennessee, 52 percent of electric gener electricity generation, 6,000 jobs. Missouri. 81% of electricity generation, 81% in the state of Missouri. That's 4,600 jobs at stake. Uh, Montana, 58%. And what's the last one there? It should be Pennsylvania. Put that down. Louisiana, where, uh, that's 53% electricity generation. These are all states that depend on coal for their electricity generation. And lastly, Pennsylvania, 48.2% of electricity generation, 49,000 jobs would be lost in Pennsylvania if Utility Mac is passed. That's significant. I wouldn't be surprised if all these senators from coal states and that I just mentioned will vote for Senators Alexander and Pryor's bill and that says, let's kill coal, but let's put it off for six years. I repeat, it doesn't do any good to delay the death sentence on coal six years. Contracts will already be violated and the mines will be closed. So I'd like to say to my colleagues that um, your constituents will see right through those of you who choose a cover vote. The American people are pretty smart and they know that there's only one real solution to stop, not just delay EPA's war on coal. And I hope they will join Senator Manchin and Senator Nelson and me and several others and stand with the constituents instead of President Obama and his EPA, which will make it painful every step of the way for them all. We need to pass SR. J37 and put an end to President Obama's uh, war on coal. You know, this is the last chance that we have to do this. There's no other vote coming along. If you don't want to kill, if you don't, don't want to kill coal, you've got to uh, support SRJ37. It's our last chance to do it. Again, we don't know when this is going to come up. It, it's, it's, it is locked in, in in a time limit unless we, by unanimous consent, increase that time. And I have no objection to putting it off to after the Farm Bill because that's a very important piece of legislation. So we'll wait and see what, that, what takes place. And with that, I uh, so, uh, yield the floor. Under the previous order, the Senate stands in recess until 2.15 p.m. a break now to attend their weekly party caucus lunches back at 2